being presented to you live stream now from the Central Church of Christ here in Martinsburg, West Virginia. We are delighted to be with you in this fashion today, and we're so thankful that you have tuned in to this continuing study of the book of Romans. May I encourage you to open your Bible to Romans chapter 2. We'll be beginning in chapter 2 this morning. Uh, at the end of the last class, we had pretty much covered up through the end of chapter 1 and seen where Paul was, after making the point that the gospel is God's power of salvation, he, in the rest of that chapter, develops the concept that the Gentiles were lost. Without the gospel, the Gentiles were in a lost state. They had basically rejected God's uh, natural revelation of himself, if you will. That is, God had shown through his creation, through nature, that he is God, that he is everlasting, that he is powerful, that he is divinity. Uh, they had not chosen to retain God in their thinking, and they had given that up. And it says in verse 26, Paul writes, for this cause God gave them up. We learn from this that if we give up on God, if we reject God and turn away from the resources that he makes available to us, that there comes a point where God will give up on us. And so we need to be receptive to God and his love and concern for us. That's chapter 1. Now, in chapter 2, before we read the first few verses together, you should have received uh, a printout or, or a uh, document entitled Study Questions, Romans chapter 2 and 3. It looks like this. If you didn't get that, you may want to check your email and uh, or your other communication from the church and open that up because we will be looking at those questions uh, regarding at least Romans chapter 2. The prior sheet, Romans chapter 1, I uh, had a few questions at the end, and I'd like to notice those before we move into the text of chapter 2 together. <clears throat> question number 22 on that sheet, this is again the study questions from Romans 1. What is meant by the wrath of God? We saw in our last study, actually two weeks ago, that the, the, ra the term wrath of God, which is used there in verse 18, where he says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hinder the truth in unrighteousness, that the phrase wrath of God refers to the punishment for transgression of God's will. He's not talking here about human type of anger, like somebody um, you know, suddenly blowing up, losing their temper, this is God's legal wrath, the punishment that results from a transgression of God's will. And that is, it follows from God's hatred of sin, his hatred of sin. Question 23, was the wickedness of men done in ignorance? Well, uh, yes, it was done in ignorance. But then the rest of that question is, was it excusable? And the answer there, of course, would be no. They were ignorant of God, but they had no excuse, Paul says, because God had revealed himself and made this information available to man. And Paul argues that this was done intentionally by God. The creation was set up this way so that they may be without excuse uh, because the things that are true of God at least certain things, are clearly observable in his creation. Verse 19 says, because that which is known of God is manifest in them, or made known in them, for God manifested it unto them. For the invisible things of him since the creation of the world are clearly seen, being perceived through the things that are made, even his everlasting power and divinity. Now watch it, that they may be without excuse. So sometimes ignorance is no excuse, and that's certainly the case with regard to God. Question 24, 
Verses 17 and 18 refer to two revelations. What are these? Well, the, the first, of course, is the gospel. We've talked about that revelation of God by inspiration through the inspired writers. The second would be nature itself. <clears throat> God's uh, making known certain things uh, through the creation. Uh, and, and he has revealed uh, his nature in that way. All right, next question, number 25. How does one hinder the truth in unrighteousness? There's that phrase there that we see at the end of verse 18. Well, by not loving and respecting God and his word, by not obeying his word and having the proper appreciation for it, we hinder the truth in unrighteousness. Verse number 26. Was there ever a time when knowledge of God was not available to any portion of mankind? Answer, no. There's never been a time in the history of the world when a knowledge of God was not available. Now, it doesn't mean that people accepted it or appropriated it, but God has always made his nature known to mankind. Number 27, the invisible things of God are perceived how? Well, they're perceived by the things which are made, Paul says. Uh, verse, uh, verse 20, the invisible things of him since the creation of the world are clearly seen, being perceived through the things that are made. Number 28, what attributes of God are referred to specifically? Well, same verse is everlasting power and divinity. The fact that God is everlastingly powerful and that he is God. These attributes of God are, are re specifically referred to here as having been uh, perceivable through the creation of God. Number 20, 29, what would you say was the condition of the Gentiles before the gospel came? Well, because they had rejected God, they were, they were lost. Again, verse 26, For this cause God gave them up unto vile passions, and so on. Number 30, Did the Gentiles need the gospel? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Paul argues here that the gospel is God's power of salvation. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. And then number 30, 31, how do verses 18 through 32 relate to the point announced in verse 16? And remember, that point was that the gospel is God's power unto salvation. How do these verses relate to that? It shows the inexcusableness of the Gentiles. It shows that the Gentiles were lost without the gospel of God. Now, Paul's Jewish readers, when this letter was first written, would have heartily agreed with all of that. I believe they would have said, Amen, Paul, preach on. In chapter 2, however, Paul changes the subject. He broadens his scope now to include the Jews, and he shows clearly that the Jews are in the same boat. You'll notice that at first he does not refer to them as Jews. He doesn't uh, reveal his hand, if you will. He doesn't make it clear yet, but it becomes clear as the argument progresses. So let's go into Romans chapter 2, beginning at verse uh, 1, and I'm going to... There is a picture of your study questions, by the way. Again, if you didn't receive those, let us know, but you should have them in your... Uh, in your inbox. If you are not receiving those, by the way, ch talk with or com communicate with uh, John, Jonathan Bennett, and uh, also check your junk mail. Your computer may be treating them as junk, and you'll need to go in and move them into your inbox so that you have access to them. Here's the text, chapter 2 and verse 1. Wherefore, thou art without excuse, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judges another, thou condemnest thyself. 
For thou that judgest dost practice the same things. Verse 2. And we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against them that practice such things. And reckonest thou this, O man, who judges them that practice such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? Verse 5. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up for thyself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to every man according to his works. All right, there's a, a lot of content there. We're going to go back and just pick a few things out of verses 1 through 6. You notice at the beginning he uses the word wherefore. Wherefore, again, is one of those connecting words, and now he is connecting the thoughts that have been laid out in chapter 1 to this ongoing progression of argument that he's laying out. Namely, the same thing is going to apply to you Jews, which I had just stated with regard to the Gentiles. And he says, wherefore thou art without excuse. Now again, Paul doesn't specifically say here that he's talking to the Jews as if to disarm their prejudice, he begins to build the argument first. But it's going to become very, very clear here that that's exactly who he's speaking to. And he says that you Jews are without excuse as a result of this as well. Why is that? Notice how he describes them. He says, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. All right. The religious Jews of that day prided themselves, generally speaking, they prided themselves very highly. Their religious knowledge, their religious standing, they viewed themselves as learned and uh, God's chosen people. They were special. Uh, they may have missed the point big time on what it meant to be God's chosen people because it seems that many of them were patting themselves on the back, spiritually speaking. They were looking down their nose, figuratively, at their religious neighbors, and particularly were looking down their nose at these Gentiles. But Paul turns the tables now and begins to turn the tables and says, you also are without excuse. You who are doing this judging of others, whosoever thou art. And why, why are they without excuse, Paul? For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. Now, how is that? Well, Paul is going to go on to develop this and show that they were guilty also of breaking God's law. None of them kept God's law perfectly. They may have thought, they may have prided themselves and thought, oh, you know, we are very, very devout and special in God's sight, but they too were falling short. But there's another thought here, too, that I want us to see in terms of why they were without excuse. In judging itself, in the concept of judging, they were acknowledging that there is a standard of righteousness. Remember, righteousness can be called the key word in the book of Romans. That's, that's one of the key concepts. And how can we obtain this this righteousness that we need before God. Well, by acknowledging that, there, that others were, quote, wrong, they were admitting that there is such a thing as right and wrong, that there is a standard of righteousness, if you will. And in so doing, they were condemning themselves because they were not perfect either. After all, if God is going to condemn all of those who break the law, that would pretty well rule out everybody, wouldn't it? If you're talking about living a perfect life, nobody could say that they had never sinned, that they had never broken, if you're a Jew, you had never broken the law of Moses. Now, remember in that connection that the, the people that we call the Jewish people, the Israelites, were at Mount Sinai given a special law. 
They were God's chosen people in that through them would come the Messiah who would represent the Savior of the world. They were, yes, they were God's chosen people, and they were given a chosen law, a special law. But with great opportunity comes great responsibility. With that special law came a special responsibility to obey and to keep that law. And how many of them did that? Jesus showed in his earthly ministry that even their religious leaders, the ones who were supposedly so devout, that they fell woefully short. They were hypocritical. They were binding these things on others, but they were failing to practice them themselves. So there are two components here, two points to pick up on. One, they were not keeping the law perfectly themselves. And two, by judging, they were acknowledging that there is a right and a wrong. So Paul says, guess what? You too are without excuse. In verse 2, and we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against them that practice such things. See, God is going to be the judge. God isn't going to miss this. He's not going to get this wrong on the day of judgment. He's not going to say, oh, you were a Jew? Uh, well, I'm just going to let, that, let things slide for you. All right? Paul is, has, has proven in chapter 1 that the Gentiles were lost, but now he's showing that the same fact is true of the Jews. And he's going to develop this all the way through chapter 3 and verse 20. So this is a, a, an important point for them to get. And in it, there are a lot of lessons for us uh, today. Now, what does it mean when he says, thou that judgest? I mean, obviously, he's not talking here about judging in the sense of recognizing distinctions that God has made. Right? I mean, that isn't wrong. In fact... We are required to recognize such distinctions. Didn't Jesus say, for example, by their fruits ye shall know them? By their fruits ye shall know them? Matthew chapter 7 and verse 16. I heard a preacher say one time, I'm not a judge, I'm a fruit inspector. Jesus taught the concept of recognizing people by their fruits. That kind of judgment, if you will, is not what Paul is talking about here, what he's, he, he is warning against here. The Bible teaches us that we are to make judgments. We're to judge righteous judgment. But what is the difference between making righteous judgment and judging others in the sense that they were doing, which Paul condemns? If you think of the word condemn rather than judge for a minute, I think you come maybe a little closer to the meaning involved here in, in verse 1 because he actually uses the word condemn in this sentence. Notice again, you are without excuse, thou that judgest, for wherein thou, thou judges another, thou condemnest thyself. To judge in this sense in a negative sense, is to look down upon others in a condemning sort of way. To hold oneself up as better than other people. To be, as we say, judgmental. That is what Paul is condemning. And we, we need to guard against this, brethren, very, very, very uh, stringently. We need to be careful that we do not look down our nose at other people morally speaking, and, and think that we're somehow better than everybody else. But there's a vast difference between that and simply recognizing the judgments that God has already made in his word and honoring them and teaching and encouraging others to abide by them and, and to make sure that we are abiding by them ourselves. All right. Now, to restate the point here, Paul has said that the Jews 
condemn Gentiles because of their sins. But the Jews were therefore implying their own ability to recognize sin, which condemned them. Because in recognizing that sin is wrong, sin is a bad thing, they would have to acknowledge that they too had fallen short, that they too had sinned. <clears throat> Since they could recognize sin in Gentiles, they had no excuse for failing to recognize the sin in their own lives. And that is Paul's point in those particular verses. Now notice the nature of God's judgment here. He says in verse 2 that we know that the judgment of God is according to truth. God is going to take into account all truth, all facts, all relevant information. I've been in courtrooms before where I could tell by the way the judge was talking that there were certain facts, certain pieces of information that were not clear, that needed to be brought out. I could tell that, were, or maybe by questions that a jury had asked in submitting questions to a judge, that there were certain key pieces of information that they hadn't gotten. God isn't going to be like that. God knows all of the facts. He has it all well in mind and, and has a grasp of, of all of it. He is going to take everything that is relevant into account. That's what the nature of God's judgment is. It is against all evil. And Paul is basically saying, if you, if you understand that, how could you possibly think that you're going to escape the judgment of God? You think he's going to miss you, miss out on, you, on your evil, and just focus on the evil of other people? Of course not. So, they're, these Jews, they're continuing in sin, would, uh, would propose a real problem for them. Verse 3 says, And reckonest thou this, O man, who judgest them that practice such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Reckon this? Do you, do you reckon that you will escape, he says? Do you think that you will escape the uh, judgment of God? No, God isn't going to miss anything. He's not going to overlook anything, or uh, it's not going to escape his notice. Now, either they thought that God was going to overlook it, or, look at verse 4, or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. You see, you're either mistakenly thinking that God is going to miss your own sin, or you are taking advantage of the goodness of God. You're despising God's goodness and, and forbearance and long-suffering. The word forbearance means the, the actual delaying of sentence, delaying of, of punishment. To forbear is to, to put up with the sin that these Jews were committing. Doesn't God do that? I mean, doesn't he forbear, put off punishment because of his goodness and his mercy and his patience? Doesn't he give people time to repent? Let me ask you a question. When someone is good to you, does something good for you, maybe some benefit of some kind, maybe a gift, how do you act? How do we react when somebody does us a favor? I have known of people who, when they were done a favor, were very, very grateful. I mean, they would write a thank you note, or they'd pick up the phone and call and say, man, I really appreciate that, or they would just let you know somehow, man, I really appreciate what you did for me. But there are others who, when somebody does them a favor, they actually become somewhat indignant. Maybe they become entitled in their own mind. Uh, it's possible to even become embittered or angry if the favor is not continued, you see. Uh, 
God gives patience and forbearance and goodness so that people will have time to repent. The Bible says that back in the days of Noah, the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while that ark was being prepared. Why didn't God just bring sudden destruction upon the earth? Because he is patient. And he gave those people many, many opportunities, years of patience. All right. But that also teaches us that there is a point where God says, you know, that's it. And that's what Paul is saying here. Don't despise the goodness and the forbearance, the, the, the patience, if, if you will, of God. Don't treat it lightly. Realize that God has not punished you, but he will if you reject him, if you, if you are not faithful to him. He is being patient in giving you opportunity to repent. Back in Acts chapter 7, you remember when Stephen was preaching that beautiful gospel sermon and he was relating Old Testament history to a Jewish audience that was not receptive. At one point, Stephen turns suddenly in Acts chapter 7, down around verse 51, he says this, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart, and ears. You do always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do ye. Stiff necked, resisting the Holy Spirit. When God is presenting the truth to you and has sent you prophets and teachers down through the years, look at Moses and, and all of the prophets that have come since then and you still are stiff-necked. You will not repent or accept the goodness of God. That, friends, is despising the goodness of God. We have to be very careful that we do not fall into that because God has truly been good to all of us. But what are they doing? Verse 5 says, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, you see, hard-hearted, that's what it means to be stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. To be so callous that even when God is bending over backwards, figuratively, to help us, we, because of our hardness of heart, do not accept it, do not re reject sin in our own lives. God is good. He's kind. He is forbearing, that is, actually holding back on his judgment. And he is long-suffering. Uh, that's his disposition, his mental attitude, patience toward each of us. All right. So, verse 6 says, Who will render to every man according to his works? Man is going to be judged according to the nature of his works his deeds, okay, what he actually says and does, what he actually produces from his heart, not just what's in his heart, but what he does with what's in his heart. There are a number of verses that clearly teach that. I'm thinking especially about John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, where Paul said, or John, rather, uh, writing with regard to what our Lord said, uh, said that they have all done, uh, they have done good unto, I'm sorry, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of judgment. And then Paul writes this, for we must all be made manifest before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he hath done whether it be good or evil. Notice, and that's from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, notice that judgment is going to be based upon what we've done according to whether it was good works or bad, good or evil. That is the basis for God's judgment. All right, moving forward then in verse 7, 
This is Romans chapter 2, verse 7. To them that by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and incorruption eternal life. Okay? What is going to be the reward for those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and incorruption? What is their reward? Paul says eternal life. Now notice, we don't get to eternal life unless we seek it. Okay? I fear sometimes that we think that we're going to get to heaven kind of just by accident, you know, we're just because we are, quote, a member of the church or because our parents were good people or, or because we don't do this sin or that sin or, you know. No, Paul says there's a seeking involved those who seek for glory and honor and incorruption their reward is going to be eternal life but on the contrary verse 8 unto them that are factious he says and obey not the truth notice again the component of obedience salvation isn't by faith only salvation is by works of obedience by grace have you been saved through faith. And faith implies working faith, works of obedience to God. All right. You see then that by works a man is justified and not by faith only, James 2.24. All right. So those who are not obedient, those who do not work, those who obey not the truth, he says, but obey unrighteousness. Now notice there, <laughs> even those who do not practice good works are working people but they're working unrighteousness uh, we have to be careful here again sometimes we think well I, i'm not really doing anything bad I, I'm, a, I'm a good guy i don't kill anybody i mean i don't steal and rob and and I, i'm not hurting anybody well paul says salvation goes beyond that it goes beyond failing to do evil. There is a positive duty to do that which is good. Works of righteousness. Those who obey not the truth but obey unrighteousness, their result shall be wrath and indignation, tribulation and anguish. Those are some hard words. You know, nobody wants to suffer tribulation or anguish. You can picture the, the, the torment of the rich man there in Luke chapter 6 who lifted up his, 16, who lifted up his eyes in Hades. And remember, he, was, he said, I am in torment in this flame. All right. Paul reaffirms that here. He says that there is an eternal destruction or punishment involved with regard to those who are not obedient to the truth but obey unrighteousness. There'll be God's judgment, God's condemnation, his wrath, his indignation, tribulation, and anguish upon how many of them? Upon every soul of man that worketh evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. Okay? <clears throat> so just like the gospel is for all, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, you know, those who reject the gospel face a punishment that is for all, to, to, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. All right, nobody is left out of God's plan here. Verse 10, but glory and honor and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no respect of persons with God. Now, that last statement there is worthy of our careful attention. It sort of reiterates what Peter had observed back in Acts chapter 10. You remember he had seen that great vision of the sheet let down from heaven filled with all manner of beasts, good and evil. And the command was given, arise, Peter, kill and eat. And he said, not so, Lord. My lips have never touched anything unclean. God said, what I have cleansed Make not thou common or unclean. 
And it was after that demonstration thrice that Peter finally realized, he said, I now perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation, he that worketh righteousness and believeth in God is acceptable to him. Okay? God is no respecter of persons. There is no respect of persons with God. There was a time when the Jewish people could say, yes, we are God's chosen people. Why? Because they had somehow done something worthy or remarkable? No. But because God was going to use their lineage, their race, to bring a Savior into the world. But that gave them no reason to brag about it or to be, or to be boastful. And today, today, that distinction, spiritually speaking, is gone. The Savior has come. The gospel has arrived, and it's here for all people, Paul said. The gospel is God's power of salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek, Romans 1.16. So there's no more any special people, if you will, no more God's chosen people except those who obey Christ. Those who are in Jesus Christ would be God's chosen people today. And it isn't because of any great shakes on their part. It's because of Jesus Christ. See, there's no respect of persons with God. Our Constitution says that the government is not to be a respecter of religious establishments. We're not to pick one religion above another like they did back in England, you remember, and here's the, the Church of England is going to get favored treatment under the law. No, not in this country. One church or establishment, religious establishment, will not be elevated above another. Okay? Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. And God makes no law respecting one person above another there is no respect of persons with god all right moving to chapter 2 and verse 12 for as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without the law and as many as have sinned under the law shall be judged by the law now notice here that again the distinction between jews and gentiles and it, the principle works the same both ways those who were outside of the law of Moses, that would be the Gentiles. Uh, if they sinned without that law or outside that law, they would perish without the law or outside of that law. And as many as have sinned under the laws, that is, you Jews, you, you were given this law of Moses and still sinned, guess what's going to happen to you? Paul says you will be judged or condemned by the law verse 13 for not the hearers of the law are just before god but the doers of the law shall be justified see it was fine to hear moses read off those commandments and all the people would say amen and the jewish people oh wow what what great teachings of moses in the first five books of the old testament they were near and dear to their heart and they, they heard them so often they could probably recite most of it from memory. Paul says, guess what? Hearing it doesn't make us just before God. Jesus would say, not everyone that heareth, but he that doeth. It's important that we not just audibly give notice to the gospel but that we actually take it into our lives and practice it before God. Verse 14, For when Gentiles that have not the law do by nature the things of the law, these not having the law are the law unto themselves, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness therewith, and their thoughts one with another, accusing or else excusing them. Now, these verses teach that the Gentiles, even though they didn't have the law of Moses, would sometimes live 
righteously before God. They would live as though they had the law. They would do uh, by nature uh, in accordance with their conscience. They would live a righteous life. Now you might be wondering, well, what law were they under? They didn't have the law of Moses, so what law did they have? Well, they still had the same law that they'd had from the beginning, right? What we call the patriarchal law of God. They still had that. And so even though they were not under the Mosaical law, they could still be righteous people. They could still live a life that was righteous before God. And when they did that, in essence, followed their hearts and did what they knew was right and conscientious before God, they, in essence, were a law unto themselves, Paul says. These not having the law are the law unto themselves in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts. Okay, they were good-hearted, and they were still obeying God, even though they were outside of the Mosaic law. Now today, folks, we don't have this distinction anymore, you know, those under the Mosaic law and those not under the Mosaic law. When Christ died, Paul teaches that the old law, the Mosaic law, was nailed to the cross. And all were united as one under the law of Christ. So we're all, all of us today, under that one law of Jesus Christ. The Hebrew writer said, God having of old time spoken unto the fathers and the prophets in divers portions and in divers manners, hath in these last days spoken unto us in his Son through whom he made the worlds, whom he appointed heir of all things. So today, God is speaking and holding us accountable to the law of Christ, speaking through his son, the word of God, the New Testament, the gospel, as Paul would call it. And verse 16, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men according to my gospel by Jesus Christ. That is, not that he's going to judge those Old Testament people under the gospel, <clears throat> that is, in accordance with the gospel, he is going to judge them according to the law under which they lived, according to my gospel. That is the news that I'm preaching. That's the good news, that people are going to be judged in accordance with the law that was in effect when they lived. And today, folks, that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's Paul's point uh, of chapter 2 and verse 16. Now, we're getting short on time, so I just want to, I think we're going to stop there at verse 16, but let me just mention a couple of points about these questions that you have, and we'll see if we're, we're all together on some of these answers. Question one says, what is the basic point of chapter two, and how does this relate to chapter one and verse 16? The point is that the Jews were lost too, Okay. That relates to chapter 1 and verse 16, which says the gospel is the power of salvation. Now, who cares about the power of salvation unless we realize that we're lost? So that's how these points are connected in chapter 2 and back to, relating back to chapter 1 and verse 16. Number 2, were the Gentiles excusable for their wickedness? No. Even though they didn't have the Mosaic law to guide them, they had God's revelation through nature. They had what we think of as the patriarchal law. How about the Jews? Were they excusable? Absolutely not. And, the, and these points Paul makes very clearly. Number three, did God's goodness lead the Jews to repentance? No. In fact, they despised the goodness of God, Paul said. They rejected it, his goodness, his forbearance, his patience or long-suffering. Number four, men will be judged according to their blank. Remember we looked at 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10? They'll be judged according to their deeds, their works, whether they be good or bad. Number five, we're going to stop with this. Who is the real Jew? And I want you to think about that for next week. Who is the real Jew in the sense that Paul is using that? And in answering that, you may want to go over also and read Galatians chapter 3. These books should be read together anyway. That chapter will help. Galatians chapter 3, 
That's the question that we want to begin with, Lord willing, next week. Thank you so much for listening today. This is a, a material that is of benefit to all of us, and I appreciate you giving it your attention this morning. I invite you to join us in our worship service together. You may need to log out and log back in. Last week we had a few people saying they couldn't get in. They were watching something else uh, from last week. No, just just back out and re-log in and you'll be fine and we'll see you at that time at our worship together. Thanks for joining us in the class. <laughs>